This time we're making our way through Nintendo Power number 47 for April of 1993 and our penultimate issue of Nintendo Power's fifth year. Our cover game this issue is Star Fox, which I will be covering this time. We have an ad just inside the cover for the upcoming Super Star Fox Weekend event. In the letters column, the prompt is what column readers would drop in favor of their own column. There are a lot of people who would like to see George and Rob's column dropped, which has been done, sort of, by changing the format of the Now Playing column again. There are also readers who would like to see the comics dropped, or see the High Score or Celebrity Profile columns dropped. Now, the latter column has become sporadic, so they're probably already going that way anyway. High Score is also somewhat off and on. Comics sticking around, the lineup is of course changing. We also have a blurb on the 1992 Nintendo World Championships, which had Paul Heyman, back when he was known as Paul E. Dangerously, and Terry Funk as Masters of Ceremonies. Our first guide to the issue is for Star Fox, with maps of the first stage of each course, and notes on the subsequent stages for each route. Star Fox is definitely a inventive and cutting-edge ed cutting game for the time, but it's a game with some very real issues. In particular, the controls are a little sluggish, and it runs into issues with giving the player enough information to properly control the game. In particular, the game needs the player to be able to tell where they're aiming, so they can target enemies that are, that are pursuing friendlies, and also not shoot friendlies, and it also needs to tell the player where the bits of their ship are in relation to the environment, as several levels in the game require the player to handle some very tight maneuvering. The problem is the game never does both. If you're in the cockpit view, you can tell what you're targeting, but you have no peripheral vision to tell you where the rest of your ship is. If you're in third-person view, you know where your ship is in perspective with the rest of the environment, but until you start shooting, you don't know what you're aiming at. Now, Star Fox 64 fixes this, but the issues still remain with the first game, and they're issues which mar the experience of playing it. Next up is a compilation guide for a variety of fighting games. Unlike the sports rundown earlier this year, we have actual meaningful information on each game, its mechanics, its gameplay modes, and the style of the game. Five games are covered. Brawl Brothers, Doomsday Warrior, Fatal Fury, Street Combat, which is a reskin of a Ranma 1 half game because of the lack of license and because we're trying to de-Japanify things because mainstream audiences in the early 90s are racist, and Ultimate Fighter. First off is Brawl Brothers, which is a more conventional brawler, with the fighting game component coming up in the versus mode, sort of like with the Double Dragon games. As brawlers go, this game is pretty fun. I appreciate that the game has five playable characters, while Final Fight had only two, and each has a variety of special moves. I also appreciate that you can hit enemies who are knocked down, but not knocked out, during their animations while they're getting up. I also like that the options menu lets you adjust your lives and number of continues, though you sadly cannot set unlimited continues. Still, I'd describe this as being almost on par with Streets of Rage or Final Fight, at least in terms of controls and difficulty balancing. Now, the closest you get to setting unlimited lives is a action replay code, or rather a way to get around the continue limit, is the, is the pro action replay code, which I'd recommend doing, particularly if you're playing this on a console or retro clone console with a built-in sheet device. Next is Doomsday Warrior, and while it's a game I'd like to I want to like, considering it's put out by Renovation, as one of the few titles they put out for the Super Nintendo, this game is a pretty crappy fighting game. First off, the game's controls are oversimplistic. The blocking functionality in the game is rather obtuse, using the shoulder button buttons to block, instead of pressing back on the D-pad or using a designated face button. And while you can remap some of the game's controls, the blocking functionality is one of those buttons that you can't remap. 
The game also has a designated jump button, which is a control move that I'm not particularly a fan of in fighting games, and if you notice, it's one that most fighting games have taken to the wayside or left behind until the introduction of 3D in the PlayStation generation. Now, the 16-bit generation of fighting games is relatively new, so I understand that the developers are still learning the ropes of the genre. Still, there are some things that you would have thought they would have picked up from Capcom that apparently they didn't. This is kind of a shame, because the game has a visual style that I want to like, reminding me a lot of late 80s, early 90s anime like Demon City Shinjuku, Wicked City, and Fist of the North Star, only without the ultraviolence and really weird sexuality. Next is Fatal Fury, and I like Fatal Fury from a character standpoint. The narrative of the game is structured better than the Street Fighter games are, and the overall universe and world building of Fatal Fury and its sequels and spin-offs like Art of Fighting and, well, the King of Fighters series works better and is more thought out. But the controls in this game are a little rough. Again, because this game uses a single punch button, a single kick button, and a designated throw button. The good news is this game doesn't use designated jump or block buttons. I can forgive this. Again, developers are trying to figure out what form fighting games will take on 16-bit consoles, and in this case it feels like the console controls were specifically designed with the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis in mind, in terms of the home ports, as it only uses three buttons. The game visually has some nice touches, and considering I know where SNK is going with fighting games, I know they're going to improve from here, and so it's interesting watching this game and playing it in that context. Street Combat, as mentioned earlier, is a poorly reskinned version of the first Ronmo and Half fighting game. This part alone kind of pisses me off, as aside from the license issues and whether or not they have the license, it's basically giving into the fiction that we should pander to racist people by getting rid of everything that makes this Japanese, which is an issue that I'll be having with another title this issue. Aside from this problem, the game has several other faults that make it frustrating. In particular, as with Doomsday Warrior, the game has designated jump and block buttons in addition to a designated special attack button, as opposed to Street Fighter 2. This, again, the frustration of this comes from the fact also that Street Fighter 2 has designated buttons for different grades of attack, heavy and light attack, and lets you manage those for improved strategy, and again, lets the D-pad handle block and jump, whereas here we are improperly using the buttons that are available on the Super Nintendo controller, which makes this for a less enjoyable game to play. Ultimate Fighter is actually a sequel to Flying Dragon for the NES. It plays well enough, with a story mode that controls like Kung Fu. The controls this mode are decent, though as with the other games we've covered this issue, it doesn't quite take advantage of the full range of inputs that the SNES controller has available, only really using three of the face buttons, not really the shoulder buttons at all. That said, it does some things right that the other games don't. While there's a designated jump button, you can also jump by pressing up on the D-pad, and rather than pressing a designated block button to block enemy attacks, you just block by pressing back on the D-pad. Now, blocking doesn't work consistently in terms of mitigating damage. From a control standpoint, it works better than some of the other titles. The game does run into some issues with not uh, properly recognizing attacks impacting it. In terms of based on your distance to the opponent, if you're in an intermediary distance from the actual end of your kick or whatever, somehow the game has your attacks not land, which is frustrating, but I do still kind of have fun with this game. I, I enjoyed the brawling mode for what it was, the kung fu-esque mode for what it was. I'm not going to give it a wholehearted recommendation by any means, but I thought it was kind of neat. Speaking of four kids in games, we have Pocky and Rocky, where the characters from the original title are changed from a shrine maiden and a tanuki into goblins. They didn't even bother changing the sprites like they did for Power Blade, not for the protagonists, not for any of the characters in the game. Anywho, the guide gives maps for the first half of the game and notes on the second half. Pocky and Rocky is the first commando-esque run-and-gun I've covered thus far on the Super Nintendo. 
It's the closest, the closest we've gotten to this is Contra for the Super Nintendo with some of the top-down shooter stages, but that's pretty much it. This game controls really well, and it definitely shows off the advanced processing capabilities of the Super Nintendo, as the game has a ton of sprites on screen, from your characters, to the enemies, to shots from both sides, some of which can get fairly large and involved, like these spinning bones thrown by skeletons, and so on. Now, as with most shooters, this is a game that where you really need to take the time to learn bullet patterns. Now, the game lets you take multiple hits, so that when you get to boss fights, you have time on those fights to actually learn those patterns before you get a game over and have to start all over again. The game also appears to not have um, limited continues, which is also a nice touch. It bears mentioning, and I said this on the discussion of the article itself, that while the game in its text tries to hide the fact that this game is Japanese, this game is pretty overt that it is about yokai. Like, a lot of traditional types of yokai are featured in the game, including stuff that's like the animate umbrellas, for example. It's kind of impressive that at least they didn't change the sprites, and it's it is, that part at least is nice, particularly in comparison with the redone Rumble and Half game from earlier this very issue. Next is Sim Earth an adaptation of the PC game, which is much more of a digital toy than SimCity is, and honestly, I'm going to skip this game because it feels like something that's probably kind of unreviewable. It's either something you enjoy or you don't. There's no real feed positive or negative feedback loop in the game, because it's just a sandbox. It'd be like reviewing the Universe Toolbox on Steam. Moving on, we continue with the Super Nintendo titles with Congo's Keeper, another caveman-themed platformer. The guide has maps for most of the game. Congo's Keeper is a decent enough platformer. Graphically, it feels like a slower-paced adventure island, with more verticality in platforming and with no animal friends, but with the ability to take an additional hit before you go down. There's a slot machine mechanic in the game that probably has some sort of meaningful effect, but I can't really tell what that effect is, and whether or not it's actually meaningful. Still, I could stand to play more of this game, though I couldn't justify paying more than, say, 15 or $20 for the thing. This time in Nestor's Adventures, uh, Nestor is playing Star Fox, with the tip being that if you fly through the first four arches, you get the double shot laser. Next up is Super Black Bass. This is the first 16-bit fishing game that we've covered thus far, and we have notes on the terrain for the first three tournaments. This is probably the most frustrating game I've played thus far for this show. Not because the game is bad, but because I have no idea what I'm doing wrong. And as the failure state in the game, what happens when you're playing poorly, is nothing happening. It creates a situation where I don't know what I should be doing to improve. The fish radar tells me pretty well what the terrain of the lake is, what it looks like underneath the surface, but it doesn't do a good job of telling me where the bass are, and if there's any bass at my location. It's clear to me the difficulty I'm having in this game is on me, but I'm not sure what I can do to improve. Next up is Mech Warrior, an adaptation of the first PC game. There are notes on eight of the mechs in the game, all but one of which are part of the Unseen. Though research shows that it's because they were created by the developer of the console version, not because of the whole Harmony Gold bullcrap. If you do want me to do an episode explaining the Unseen and the crazy rights nonsense that led up to it, please either let me know in the comments or, even better, back my Patreon at the level where you get to request episodes. So, this isn't my first MechWarrior Rodeo. I've played MechWarrior 2 on the PlayStation 1, and MechWarrior 3 and 4 on the PC. I know how MechWarrior games work, and unfortunately, MechWarrior on the Super Nintendo just doesn't work very well. There are several reasons to this. The first part is combat in MechWarrior very much depends on circle strafing, to maintain your shot on an enemy while trying to stay out of their line of fire and the line of fire of opposing mechs. There is no real way to circle strafe in MechWarrior on the Super Nintendo, which is weird, because the Super Nintendo has shoulder buttons, which should be conductive for this. However, instead, the shoulder buttons are used to select what weapon you're using, which is 
somewhat amusing because the select button isn't used, and this might be a good place to use that button, particularly if you don't want to change your weapon by accident. Especially if you have a weapon that uses limited ammo, like long-range missiles, missile to quit. So, I'd recommend getting one of the PC games, or for that matter, Mech Warrior 2 on the PlayStation 1, instead. In classified information, there's a code for SimCity that erases all your save data so you can start from scratch. There is also an item hack for Might and Magic for the NES. In the Star Fox comic, Star Fox is intercepted by Imperial fighters along with an attack carrier. They beat them, and then we skip through several levels in montage before Andros calls the team out with a psychic projection. Fox and company decide that they'll head through the black hole to take Andros down once and for all. Moving into Game Boy titles, we have Kid Dracula from Konami, which is technically a port of a Famicom game. We have info on the power-ups and minigames from this title, along with notes on the first five stages. This game is really goddamn cute. The sprites are perfectly sized and have tons of character, with even the first boss having a ton of flair. Starting off with a small ghost about the same size as your character, only for the ghost, once defeated, to run off and get his big brother when you beat him. And the big brother having larger sprites, both for himself and its shots. If it wasn't for the fact that this game, which consistently runs for over $100 on eBay, I'd make this a strong recommendation, but holy crap! It'd be almost be cheaper to build a retro pie at that price. We have a Game Boy port of Joe and Mac next, which already got releases for the Super Nintendo and NES. Joe and Mac for the Super Nintendo was a decent title with expressive sprites and interesting gameplay. The NES version lost a ton in the translation. The Game Boy version is the worst of these by far, because the game tries to maintain the same level of sprite size and detail as the NES version, which, as we've covered thus far, causes problems when it comes to giving you enough information to deal with opponents, combined with issues with enemies coming in from off-screen. If you want to get a Joe and Mac game, get the Super Nintendo title. On the bright side, I'm not going to have to review any more ports of the first Go and Joe and Mac game on this show anymore. Next up is Top Rank Tennis, which, as you can probably tell, is a tennis title. I don't know who thought it was a good idea to try and port or otherwise make a hardcore tennis simulator on the Game Boy, but that idea was bad. For a large part, this is because the game wants to simulate each of the possible shots in tennis and is willing to use all four of the buttons on the Game Boy to do this, including the start and select buttons, which means when you're taking shots, you're taking your thumb off the D-pad. Now, if this game was on the Super Nintendo, this would be less of an issue, because if you have four face buttons on the system, then you're just keeping your thumb on the face buttons. Hell. With the Game Boy Advance, you have two shoulder buttons, giving you four buttons you can use without taking your thumbs off the face buttons or D-pad, because you're pressing those with your uh, forefingers. This is a shame, because the physics are pretty good, and with a little practice and a better control layout, I could see doing well at this game. As it stands, I recommend giving this title a miss. We follow this up with another portable version of Chess Master, with notes on the settings. I'm going to skip this one for now, as I can't see that much outside of some AI tweaks that makes this different from the last Chess Master game I covered, particularly since the feature set does not appear to have been adjusted. So, and I'm honestly not a good enough chess player to tell what those AI tweaks are, so sadly, I'll be skipping this game. In Counselor's Corner, we have tips for Out of This World, as al along with Might and Magic. Moving into NES titles, we have a sequel for DuckTales for the NES, appropriately titled DuckTales 2. It has some of the same gameplay structure as the first game, and the guide gives maps of the first six stages, though you can take a bunch of them in any order. DuckTales 2 has much more involved level design than the first game did. Not to say the first game was overly simplistic, or too easy. Quite the contrary, the last game was perfectly balanced. However, this game is a clear case of developers looking at the core mechanics of the last game, in particular pogoing with the cane, and the gall swing mechanic, and building some more advanced levels around those mechanics, whether it's pogoing off enemies to reach higher ledges, or using the golf club swing to activate certain switches. It's a definite case of Capcom evolving their gameplay formula for DuckTales 
the same way they did with Mega Man. It actually makes it somewhat unfortunate then that I see, where I see that this is the last DuckTales game we get on virtual consoles, or rather in the 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit generation, because I'd love to see where they go with this franchise from here, and we don't get that. Next up is an overview of five upcoming titles from Koei. For the Super Nintendo and NES, we have Romance of the Three Kingdoms 2 and Uncharted Waters. And then just for the NES, we have Genghis Khan, Le Empereur. I'm probably mispronouncing that, and I apologize to any French listeners or viewers. And Nobunaga's Ambition 2. The article focuses less on what makes each game different, both thematically and mechanically, and more on how they are common as sort of an introduction to Koei's strategy games. Which means that no game in particular is really featured, and that if you're trying to decide what game to get, you get no information to decide what game you want to choose from. So, I'm going to skip these for review, but should these show up in Best of the Rest, I will definitely talk about them then. Next up is Yoshi's Cookie, a matching puzzle game. I play an unknown copy of the Super Nintendo version, which had some work on it done by Alexei Pajetnov. The NES version of Yoshi's Cookie is a perfectly acceptable puzzle game. You try to get a row or column of matching cookies, and when you get that, then that row or column is eliminated. It doesn't seem to have any real conclusion, much like Tetris, and it isn't particularly hard, but it is still fun, and is a great thing to play if you have time to kill. Additionally, because the cookies are visually distinct from each other, it's also very colorblind friendly, which is nice. Unfortunately, it doesn't really have passwords or a way to save your progress, so if there is a set endpoint, as there is with Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, there isn't really a way to get there aside from playing the whole game in one sitting. Though if you have a way to play Super Nintendo games, I'd recommend getting that version instead, if only for the better graphics and sound. Next we have Kid Clown, another mascot platformer for the NES. Kid Clown began its life as a... Mickey Mouse game that was part of the Crazy Castle series of games, and it shows. In particular in terms of the rough, somewhat unforgiving level design. It doesn't help that the reworking of the art for the US release looks equally rough and crude. The whole game just looks and feels like an early generation Famicom game, one which has learned very little from later titles. The only signs of how game development for the NES has changed and improved with increased technological know-how is the bits where Kid Cloud is running across bridges, and the screen shakes as the bridge collapses behind the player, giving an increased sense of urgency. That's pretty much it. It's a fairly generic and bland platformer, which mechanically has little to make it more enjoyable. In the top 20 columns, Street Fighter 2 is still king of the hill on the Super Nintendo, but Link to the Past is catching up. Meanwhile, Dragon Warrior 4 has entered the top 20 for the NES. In the now-playing column, of note we have Super Battle Grand Prix for the Super Nintendo, Hit the Ice for the NES, and Ring Rage for the Game Boy. In the Pack Watch column, the attitude-heavy 90s platformers have started to flow with Arrow the Acrobat. There's also a blurb on Final Fantasy Adventure 2 for the Super Nintendo, which will become more well-known as Secret of Mana. This is an issue where the best games covered here now cost the most money. From Pocky and Rocky to Kid Dracula, my two main possible picks, both for best multiplayer and for best console and best portable, they both cost over $100. Perhaps this is the best justification for why you should get a RetroPie, at least until the SNES and Game Boy bubbles burst, because the price for both of those combined is less than the cost of a retro pie. Next time, we wrap up Nintendo Power's fifth year get the, and get the results of the Nestor Awards. See you then.
very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.